Welcome back to the show. It was a moment that made headlines around the world. Journalist Yalka, uh, Yalda sorry, Hakim, who grew up in Western Sydney and now works for the BBC, receiving a phone call from a Taliban spokesman live on air. Take a look. Mr Shaheen, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, OK, I'm just, just want, we've just got you on the phone, so we're just going to see if we can uh, put you on speaker. Mr Shaheen, I, I, there is a lot of chaos and confusion in, in Kabul at the moment. Can you just help us understand what the Taliban plan to do at present and next? Uh, we are awaiting a peaceful transfer of power. And Yalda Hakim joins us now. Yalda, can we just say, watching watching you on the BBC during during that time, I mean, that interview went for half an hour. How did you feel when your phone rang and and, and hearing what he was saying? Uh, my phone rang in the studio, and and I was in the middle of another live interview, and I looked down and I saw his name, and I thought, I, I've just got to take this. So I, I cut the other interviewer, the interviewee off, and and I put him on speakerphone, and then I was, just wasn't sure whether anyone could hear anything or whether the the audio was was good. But the point that I felt was most important was to put myself in the position of all of those desperate young women and girls across the country who are so frightened right now, who don't know what the future holds. And I thought, what are the questions that they would want me to ask? And what are the questions that the international community wants, wants me to ask uh, to hold this man accountable? And I thought, I'm just going to keep going with this interview until he tells me he has to go. And, you know, over and over again, I kept thinking to myself, have I covered everything? You know, I just have we covered all bases? Because this could be sort of the, the, the one moment where we can actually hear from these people before they actually do storm into Kabul. Don't forget when we did the interview, Kabul had fallen, but they'd surrounded the capital. They hadn't actually gone in. It's so bizarre, um, the last 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and for you, I'm sure that's even more heightened. But Taliban 2.0, everyone's trying to figure out the fact that he was doing an interview with you, the fact that they did a press conference mm. um, this morning. It's like they're on their best PR behaviour. But is that reality on the ground? And what about in the provinces? You know, Carl, I was in Kabul three and a half weeks ago. I travelled to Doha and I met with Sohail Shaheen there. And he said quite similar things to me and also very similar things to what you saw at that press conference. All the right things about women's rights, about about uh, protecting people's dignity, their homes, their, their, that there won't be any looting, that girls can go to school. But I also sat down with a frontline commander in Afghanistan and I sat across from this guy who had been to prison five times. He had all his teeth removed. He'd been through all sorts of torture. And he said to me, when I asked him whether girls could go to school, for example, he said, well, yeah, I suppose they could up until the age of 12 or 13. And then he mm. changed his mind mid-interview and said age 10. And then he decided they couldn't go to school at all. Mm. When I asked yeah. him about the law and order, he said, I believe in execution, stoning, and amputation of hands and feet if, if someone commits, um, you know, steel. So whether they've changed, I mean, we have to see what happens beyond the statements that they mm. give. It's very hard to see when, when, when you describe that conversation, how really? things don't go back to how they were 20 years ago. And how did you feel just seeing those scenes at the airport yesterday, people grabbing onto flights? You saw all of them jammed into that, that, um, that carrier, that US carrier? You know, Ali, I don't think there was a dry eye across the planet. I think whether you are associated to Afghanistan or not, I think as human beings, to see those images, that desperation of people, just seemed horrifying. It was absolutely horrific. More and more footage started to come out. And, you know, I was just speaking to people across the world, and they were all expressing absolute horror and outrage about what had happened. And for me, on a personal level, you know, my family left that country almost 40 years ago in, in 1983. I was I was six months old and I was only a few years old when we moved to Australia. And I often talk about being so lucky to have been brought up in Australia to, to call myself a, a, a girl from Sydney. And, and, you know, it's always going to be home. But why this has to happen sort of almost 40 years on to a people again, but in this way, you know, the withdrawal could have happened, but it didn't have to be 
the kind of Saigon moment. People talk about those images of that young young girl running, uh, you know, that we'll mm. never forget in Vietnam, running along that 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 runway. And to see this today, there's always going to be that Kabul moment. This is seared in all our memories, yeah. and I don't think we'll forget it very easily. No, and look, we we really appreciate you joining us this morning um, and, and getting your insight into it. We don't know what the days, weeks, months, or years hold ahead. Thank you, Yada. We appreciate it. Um, and also, Thanks. I mean, she does. She's got terrific foundation as well. So we'll put mm. all the details for that foundation on our website and mm. um, go and have a look. She does great work.